cold supper behind Harrods, clues in the title, revenge being a dish that is best served cold, in three words, intriguing, involving, suspenseful. The inspiration behind the cold supper behind Harrods uh, was that a long time ago I made a television programme for Channel 4 called War Heroes which was presented by the lovely Tom Baker which was an experience working with him you know having watched him as Doctor Who for years when I was a little boy um, and the what we did we, we got some special operations executive heroes we thought from the Second World War together to interview them um, and when we, when we got them together it became obvious that there was more going on between them that we didn't really understand and there was a lot of cold kind of some animosity that made me think oh well I wonder if there's something here for a, a, a play because there's a backstory here about guilt, revenge, um, unfinished business that uh, this is later on as I was thinking about this uh, after I'd made the programme uh, that, that could be the basis of a play. Um, what was interesting was Leo Marx who is played by Anton Lesser in this production um, he rang me up and pestered me on the phone <laughs> sort of insisting he, would, he had a, a chat with me because he'd been in, in the special operations executive as well. He'd been the code maker. Um, he was the expert. He was an extremely intelligent guy in, um, that who'd, uh, who also wrote Peeping Tom, the movie, and his father had owned the bookshop on Charing Cross Road, um, which became a book and then a film. And, the, and he was a lovely guy. And he took me to the Special Forces Club, which is a, a very anonymous building behind Harrods, which is hence the title of the play. And um, he sat me down there, gave me a glass of wine and started to tell me about how things really were in the Second World War in this organized, special organization. And that it hadn't all been about heroes. In fact, um, there was a lot of incompetence and betrayal involved. And, and he tried to persuade me to make the a different TV show to the one I was already making. So I felt slightly guilty that I couldn't because by that stage I, could, I couldn't change the path that we were on and it ended up being called War Heroes and it was a slightly glossy version of the truth. Um, which was another reason I wanted to write the play in the end. I am indeed excited to be back in the rehearsal room. I mean, it's not been entirely barren for the last year, but I think, you know, we've all been subsisting on a very thin, gruel-like diet, like Oliver Twist. Um, so a, a number of these projects that, um, that we've done with original theatre have been uh, done in spaces, so we have actually seen people. Most of them have been done remotely via Zoom with um, green screen, uh, but the, the Barnes People monologues we, we shot in a sort of similar way. We shot on, on the stage in an empty theatre um, in uh, Windsor, but uh, this one in the, the Oxford Playhouse, this is the first one that I've been involved in which ha is going out live. Um, so yeah, the, the, the excitement factor is, is big. What's really special about this performance is that it is live. That it's actually going to be happening right now, which uh, which is amaz amazing that actors would be willing to do that, to risk that, you know, uh, in front of potentially tens of thousands of people out there, in, outside the theatre, if they make a mistake, they've got to live with it. So uh, that's really intriguing, you know, and hopefully we'll give it another bit of energy and something extra, uh, something different. The theatre is live, so that's the, it's the nearest we've got. Um, and because this is, uh, what we're, we're calling it semi-staged, um, the actors have their scripts, We've, we have a very short rehearsal period, we just have um, a day, um, although we have done the play before um, on the radio. Um, it, 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 there, there is a kind of, um, there's an excitement, but there's also not, I hope, the terrible pressure that it must absolutely be 100% dead letter perfect you know the the it's it's a it's a it's a work in progress with a few theatrical treats that's what i would like to think of it as so the other main character who's played by stephanie cole 
um, is Vera Atkins and she was one of the management of Special Operations Executive and Leo and Stephanie um, were at odds about the way that, about the history. Vera in the play, um, as you'll see, is very interested in, um, in the official story, whereas Anton's character, Leo, is more interested in other stuff. So there's a tension there, which is really in interesting, I think, in the play. Um, David Jason's character is invented completely, whereas Vera and Leo were real people. John Harrison is, is a figment of my imagination, and he's sort of based on, on somebody, <coughs> a real, a real ex-agent, who was on uh, the original TV programme. But I'll leave that hanging because that would be giving too much away. David Morley wrote this as a radio play um, based on um, a, an incident in, in his own experience. Um, and it's, it works extremely well as a radio play because it is really quite sedentary. It's, it's basically th three people in a garden being visited by another. So it is all about the voices. However, it is of course also all about the, the psychological interplay. Um, and so that gives, um, gives us the chance to, um, when you're actually looking at the faces of these three wonderful actors, uh, to do a, a huge amount more. Um, you know, to the, the eyes being the window of the soul and all that. Um, so wh whereas they would have to pack uh, an enormous amount of complexity into their um, vocal interpretation, now we've got the added wonderful bonus of the things they don't say. Transferring this play from its radio version, Radio 4, to this internet stage kind of hybrid, which, which we're kind of developing now, and the original theatre company has been brilliant at it over the last year during all the pandemic stuff. Um, it's been interesting. Um, it's interesting for me because coming back to, um, to a, a piece that I wrote 12 or 13 years ago now, um, I wrote it in before post-truth, before Trump, before Johnson, before all of this, uh, before we became aware of uh, the way that we're being manipulated by social media and by politicians who, who realise that uh, they don't necessarily have to tell the truth all the time. It's, it's, um, it's been inter interesting because, of course, that's kind of a theme of the, the play. I was an actor for many, many, many years before I started directing. Um, and indeed, I didn't, I didn't even really know that I wanted to direct. Um, I, I, it, was, it was sort of not exactly thrust upon me, but I was in a production that, in which I was extremely unhappy and so were the rest of the cast. And the, um, a, a director friend said, look, you, you don't want to be one of those actors who sits around moaning. If, if you think you can do better, do better. And, and it was a kind of gauntlet, um, but I was then given a production to do, and, and I did. But um, you don't suddenly become a different person. Um, the, the, there, there are things that you know, I didn't know about, because I'm not trained as a director, but there are many things I did know about, and the, the, the main one being I can sort of spot when an actor's in trouble, I think. If it feels awkward for them, I kind of, I will, generally speaking, know why it feels awkward. Um, what you don't do, what I found anyway, I don't, I absolutely don't do, is want to leap up and do it myself. Um, the, the, the thrill is watching an actor do something just a little bit better or a little bit different than they thought they could do. It's absolutely not to do with, you know, here's me doing it, copy me. Um, but all the other side of it, the stuff that I didn't know about, working with a designer, working with a composer, um, has, has just been a continuing delight. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's one of the great bits of the process. And there's a, now a designer, Adrian Linford, who I, uh, I've worked with maybe eight or nine times, and he's created an environment for this on very small resources, but it's a beautiful thing. And um, it, it'll conjure up some much needed atmosphere, I hope. So that side, of, and, and Max Pappenheim has written some music, especially for the production. So all, all that side of thing, uh, the, that, that directorial side of things, I find very exciting, working with other talented people. And that's what, you know, that's what a director's job is, I think, is, uh, is in enabling a bunch of individual talents to work together in as relaxed and creative and exciting a way as possible. I came back to it and found out more in it than I, that is relevant to today. Transferring it physically from the radio to, um, to the stage and to a visual medium 
um, really hasn't been that difficult. I mean, we, I've tweaked it a bit, um, got rid of a few scenes that were in other places because we, we couldn't do that um, on the stage. Um, but mostly it's the same. I think, I think I've improved it a little bit. I came back and thought, oh, why did you write that? <laughs> um, but no, it's been great. And of course, you know, Philip Franks, the director, and I worked on the original, so, um, and he seems to know more about what I wrote than I did. So it's been, it's been interesting coming back and working with him again. Um, he's great. Um, so I think it's, yes, it's been a fairly smooth process. And of course, having the same cast, and what a brilliant cast. I mean, you know, it's dream, isn't it? Dreamland, isn't it, really? Yes, this is a funny hybrid form. Um, uh, rather like in the uh, the current Netflix series Sweet Tooth, in which um, babies are born as hybrid animals, um, this uh, pandemic has spawned a, a, a series of, um, for better or worse, uh, hybrid performances. Uh, you know, with horns and tails and funny teeth, um, and occasionally they've been uh, people clumsily working in their own bedrooms with uh, more or less appropriate backdrops. Occasionally they've been very, very um, highly polished and finished um, performances with, uh, with green screen, screen work behind actors. Very occasionally they've been monologues and increasingly as the restrictions um, elasticate, uh, they've been duologues and this time, this is a, a play with a cast of five. Um, obviously, we're very, very um, conscious of the COVID restrictions. We're meticulous in, in our standards, our health and safety standards, but it is, as near as damn it, a play. However, what it isn't is a, a fully rehearsed, learnt, performed piece. The actors will have their scripts. Uh, they've done the play before. The three main protagonists have done the play before on the radio, but of course in radio you don't learn your lines, you, you, you read off a script. Uh, but they're familiar with it and with each other. Uh, the two younger cast members are, are brand new. Indeed, w one of the cast members, uh, but the part wasn't in the original version. So uh, she is creating, from, as it were, from scratch. Um, so what we're doing is we're creating a, th a theatrical environment in which our actors Actors, having rehearsed for a day, will perform this play with each other. Um, I've, I've done a couple of this kind of thing, um, and indeed uh, BBC4 had a, 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 a t op opera, Turn of the Screw, um, on the other day, which was done site-specific in Wilton's Music Hall, where you saw the camera people and the props people and the wardrobe people scurrying around. So the kind of, um, the, the, there was an exoskeleton visible and actually it didn't detract at all it was really very exciting because you you got you you got the, the in that case the singers but in this case the actors uh, imagination taking flight and and working with each other but you were also kind of aware of the nuts and bolts um, and I hope if people tune in and oh, hello you have tuned in because you're watching this um, and you're expecting people sitting around in a in a bright white room uh, with glasses perched on the end of their noses, reading scripts and not raising their voices above a mutter. I hope you've got something very different in store. And we certainly have a few theatrical tricks up our sleeve about which I, I won't say too much. I think people um, coming to this and watching this play will, will be able to um, experience a, um, an intriguing and I hope immersive experience. Um, I think the fact that it is not quite, it's a hybrid, it's not quite a full performance. And I think that that's going to make it interesting for people because they'll be able to see elements of, of how actors work and, and how they develop their characters and how they work with a script. And I think that, that's interesting, you know, um, because um, uh, personally, personally, as someone involved in this, uh, I think it's, you know, I'm always intrigued and, and amazed at uh, how actors deal with, with the words that are put in front of them and make, them, make the characters their own. And I think you'll see that in this production, the way that great actors, three of our greatest actors, are, are able to work with words off a page and bring them to life and, 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 uh, and, and conjure something extra from what's on the page.
the, 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 one of the wonderful things about radio, about working on the radio, is um, because they're very short jobs and you don't have to learn it, you can sort of get, you can usually get anyone you want um, to, to be in it. You know, actors who you, you would just dream about getting in a stage play um, and would, you know, their agent would just you know, laugh nastily at you. Um, you fool. Um, you can get to do a radio because everyone loves radio and it's not, you're not judged and it's kind of relatively easy. So I got this fantastic cast. I mean, l largely through, um, I have to say in this case, leafing through my old address book. So I've got my old father-in-law from uh, Darling Butts of Maine, David Jason, and I've got uh, Stephanie Cole, who I've worked with a number of times, and Anton Lasser, who I've directed at the National Theatre. Uh, three just sensational sensational actors um, and when we came to do this obviously our, our, our first port of call was to offer it again to the people who did it before because why wouldn't you because it is in, in many ways the dream cast and I don't know why maybe people are stir crazy or you know feel like they've been in prison for a year and a half but they all said yes I think to everybody's enormous surprise um, and, and of course delight. This was only the second play I'd ever written, and then at the end of it, Stephanie, who's such an experienced actress, said, came up to me and said, she said, I can't put this script down. And I thought, oh, well, how fantastic. Um, so getting her back in to, to do it again with, da with David and with Anton, who are so, and they're such a good actors, it's been a joy, it's been really fantastic. Is there an affinity between actors and spies? Um, I, I, would, um, I would say kind of emphatically not, um, because what a spy has to do is completely conceal themselves. And what acting is about, although you're pretending to be somebody else, is about revealing and opening. Um, and that's absolutely what a spy must never do. Um, actors need emotional access, they need open hearts, open imaginations. Uh, a, a spy needs to be completely opaque. Um, so although, you know, from f in, in a kind of, um, from an outside view, you might think, oh yeah, you're, all, you're both dressing up and pretending to be somebody else. It, it, it's for totally opposing reasons. Special Operations Executive was set up um, under instructions from Winston Churchill and the idea was to parachute people into occupied Europe and they would work with uh, the resistance movements in the various countries. Unfortunately, a lot of these young people who were bilingual, you know, some of them might, in, in the case of the French ones, which is, this, this is what we're dealing with in, the special, in, uh, in this play, um, they, were, they were young people who'd had a background, probably her parent, who has been, in, in, you know, in French or Dutch or whatever. And they were, um, in many cases, unfortunately, they were parachuted in and into a network that already had been blown, had already been found out by the Germans and um, were captured straight away. When I was at university, um, I used to, because it was the days of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy being on television, we were all obsessed with it humming the theme tune and wondering whether some um, uh, slightly sinister Don was going to come up to you and, and invite you for tea and a glass of sherry and then try and recruit you. Um, and uh, I was, I, 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 we'd all play the game of, of, thum, of thumbing through what, what, uh, what would make us a good spy. Uh, and I, I, my list is, is full of crosses. Uh, I'm no good at crosswords or codes or that kind of thinking. Uh, I'm a complete and utter physical coward. I, uh, can't speak any other languages, but I'm quite a good liar. Would I have made a good spy? I doubt it. I think, um, well, Pip said that he, he's a very good liar, didn't he, isn't it, in his interview? I think we're all very good at disguising parts of ourselves. You know, we all kind of reinvent our personal histories and, you know, exaggerate or erase bits of it. Um, so I guess that's part of the spying way of life. I, d I don't know. I, mean, I, I, probably, I probably would have made quite a good spy. I don't know. But I think that you have to be able to embed yourself in whatever community you're in. <clears throat> so that's, um, I think maybe, yeah, OK, maybe I could be. Could be. So I think it's a bit late in my uh, career now. But I, I'm, in I'm very interested in spies. I'm particularly interested in the fact that um, 
that they purport to be discovering facts and truth, but actually I think they spend a lot of their time covering up stuff. So they're doing exactly the opposite. What you're about to see is a, a puzzle, a, a Chinese box, a trick. It starts as one thing and like one of those marvellous wooden marquetry boxes, if you twist them in a certain way, something will spring open and reveal itself. What reveals itself here is a, a sort of emotional cauldron, if you like. What we think we're seeing is a gently nostalgic piece about three old people in an English garden uh, looking back at the past. But of course, if anybody looks back at the past, it is very rarely with rose-tinted spectacles. It, it, it always involves secrets and lies, particularly in the lives of these people because of the work they've done. The secrets and lies are of life and death importance. So gradually, 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 you realize that you are not in a, a lovely nostalgic comedy, you are in a revenge drama. I think if I had to describe this play in three words, I would say guilt, revenge, and love.